This is a Federal News Network podcast. The following program is produced and furnished in conjunction with John Gilroy, managing partner of the Oakmont Group, which is entirely responsible for its content. Welcome to Federal Tech Talk with John Gilroy, managing partner at the Oakmont Group on Federal News Network. Every week, John speaks with public and private sector IT experts about some of the IT trends and challenges facing agencies and industry. Now your host, John Gilroy. Welcome to Federal Tech Talk with John Gilroy here on Federal News Network. Our guest today is Chris Hughes. He's co-founder of a company called Acquia, A-Q-U-I-A dot U-S, and, uh, you know, I've done 100, 708 shows, 709 shows, and I have big companies, I have small companies, I have software people, hardware people, I have govies, I have not govies, I've got people from associations. And I thought I'd bring in maybe a smaller company, a newer company, and find out what their perspective is on different items in the federal government, like moving to the cloud. And so uh, I have been following Chris on LinkedIn for a while here, and he always has great comments. And if you could follow him on LinkedIn, it'd be wonderful because he has very, very great comments. I started following his comments about CMMC. In fact, he was recently listed as one of the top five influencers in the area of CMMC. So he knows a whole lot about that, but he knows a whole lot about software development and security. I thought we'd bring him in to get a get a new, fresh perspective on the whole idea of cloud and cloud security. So before I go rambling on here, Chris, why don't you tell us about your background and, and uh, the forming of your company? Yeah, Chris Hughes here. Uh, uh, as, a, as you mentioned, you know, co-founder of a company called Acquia, where we focus on cloud, DevSecOps, and cybersecurity in the federal environment uh, and DOD. Uh, but prior to that, I have almost 20 years of cybersecurity experience. I started off in the U.S. Air Force, active duty, uh, left that, and uh, worked on the, on the Navy side as a civilian for four and a half years uh, doing cloud and cloud security uh, for DHA as well as the Navy, and then went from there to uh, GSA, where I was a civilian as well on a FedRAMP jab, for those familiar with FedRAMP. Uh, outside of that, I worked in various industry roles supporting programs like uh, DOD's Platform One and worked at the U.S. Space Force as well, uh, and then currently led me to co-founding my company. Um, outside of that, I also uh, teach at two different universities, uh, University of Maryland Global Campus and Capital Technology University in their graduate uh, cybersecurity programs. And I'm really active on LinkedIn around cloud security and involved with uh, community groups like Cloud Security Alliance, Cloud Native Computing Foundation, and others. Yes, uh, really, like, like I said, really worth following on, on LinkedIn. Platform One, boy, I, I love that platform. I love Nick, and Nick's gone. Yeah. Huh? So what it's, happened? It's an interesting situation. Uh, he has uh, he has a unique personality and a, a very uh, you know a powerful personality. And some people love that. Some people don't love that. And I think uh, you know it's easy to make some friends and enemies and, and you know with that kind of personality. But there's no denying uh, the impact he had from a technological perspective with the DoD. Yes, and uh, he's uh, he's just. A, I've done several interviews with him. He's just he's he's fantastic. So uh, your company, A-Q-U-I-A dot U-S, what does it focus on and, and what should the people know about it? Yeah, Acquia is the name of the company, uh, recently co-founded uh, with some partners of mine as well. Uh, we're focused on, as I mentioned, cloud uh, security, cybersecurity, and DevSecOps in the federal government space. Uh, my co-founders, uh, one of them comes from Silicon Valley where he spent you know uh, the last 10 years at companies like Amazon and, and Apple and others. Uh, so we're trying to bring, you know, that federal expertise and in, in the nuance of federal government technology, but also mixed with Silicon Valley expertise as well. Uh, we're working at uh, Centers for Medicare and Medicaid at the moment on efforts uh, such as application security maturity, uh, cloud security, threat modeling, which is really coming to the forefront uh, based on recent guidance from NIST and uh, doing some DevSecOps type work as well. Before the show, you told me you studied Brazilian jiu-jitsu. Well, in Brazil, they speak Portuguese. And there's a phrase in uh, Portuguese called misto quente which is a hot mix. And I look at your background and I go, hey, that guy's got a hot mix. <laughs> He's got a hot mix of all kinds of uh, perceptions and what's going on in the cloud. So from your hot mix, from your misto kench, what um, – so, so what are the basic challenges you think the government has just making this transition to the cloud, just from your you know, 40,000 feet up? Yeah, I actually just published an article this morning on CSO Online on this topic. You know, this uh, CISA came out with the uh, cloud cybersecurity uh, technical reference architecture document, and it was great. Half of the document focused on FedRAMP and defining cloud, you know, based on NIST 800 uh, And unfortunately, that document, you know, it's great, but it's also a decade old. Uh, same thing with FedRAMP, you know, it's been around for a decade. Uh, and as far as authorizing cloud services for federal government, you know, it has roughly 235 service offerings on the marketplace uh, in a cloud market of 15,000, for example. Uh, so there's obviously a bottleneck when it comes to authorizing cloud for government use. Uh, that's one of the major challenges. 
And also outside of that, you know, there's there's workforce challenges as well. The federal government has a, a notorious reputation of struggling to attract and retain tech talent. Um, and that causes challenges uh, as far as cloud adoption <clears throat> at different agencies. Uh, there's also the issue of uh, security. You know, outside of FedRAMP in terms of authorization, there's also folks within the government who are very risk averse, you know, uh, averse to taking on new technologies, moving data to an environment that they don't necessarily own or control physically. Um, so that's definitely been an impediment as well. Um, and then obviously on the acquisition side, you know, we've seen a lot of uh, a lot of uh, circusry with things like JEDI and now JWCC. Uh, so they aren't doing themselves any favors from the acquisition perspective and help bring enterprise cloud uh, to the federal government, basically. I remember years ago when I first started talking about software as a service, that was kind of break, breakthrough news. And now all kinds of services out there now. You know, in the space and satellite world, there's a ground station as a service. <laughs> there's satellite payloads as a service. But in your article – in the magazine, um, you talk about um, IAC or infrastructure as code. I was waiting for as a service, but infrastructure as code. So what the heck does that mean? Yeah, as far as cloud goes, you know, when we were used to provisioning infrastructure, you know, you had a, a, a server rack, a server farm. You had to physically, you know, put uh, servers in place, run cables, things of that nature. In the cloud environment, it's all API driven and it's driven by software. So you can go in there and, and write scripts, essentially templates, uh, to quickly provision infrastructure uh, and put it in place, and, and you know, you can instead of having a procurement cycle and a long lead time to get infrastructure in place, you can do it on demand uh, within the cloud environment, and that has a lot of benefits not only from a speed perspective, but there's also a security perspective. You can pre-harden uh, infrastructure as code templates, essentially align them with uh, you know CIS benchmarks or other configuration guidance, or also you know NIST 853 and compliance requirements, and those are all uh, things that you can do from infrastructure as code perspective. Uh, to bake in security, as they say, shift security left, right, and expedite ATO timelines and, you know, give uh, system owners, you know, pre-hardened environments to work with. You know, I've been doing this many years. Uh, oh, 10, 15 years ago, I had an enterprise architect come in the studio, and he had 11 by 17 laminated piece of paper with eight-point type on it with all these boxes and checks, and he handed it to me, and I didn't know what to do with it. It was, it was like it was very, very uh, static. And uh, we're living in a dynamic world. And so you didn't waltz in here with any kind of, uh, you know, laminated plastic or anything. You waltz in with, okay, here's the situation. It's, it's, it's going to be in flux, and, and we don't know what's going to happen tomorrow because who could have predicted COVID, and we have to be loose and flexible. Um, it seems like your approach is, is uh, from an enterprise architecture approach. Is that what you're looking at, really? Yeah, definitely. I mean, uh, we know that the cloud environment, you know, it changes much more rapidly than the, the physical environment, data center environments that we're used to. And so long, long gone are the days of, you know, a static architecture diagram that stays in place for long periods of time. Things are constantly in flux. Um, we need to approach things like that uh, from a security perspective as well. Things are going to change. Things are going to shift. And we have to be prepared to respond accordingly. Yeah, I just – I never thought of this uh, – Code I say I understand how APIs work, but uh, so is this like is this like a template? Is this an approved template? Does this have to be approved by certain guidelines, or where does a template fit in, or is it a template? Yeah, so it essentially is. It's a template, you know, uh, or a script if you want to refer to it as that. Uh, you know, the leading cloud service providers say uh, Microsoft Azure uh, has their own uh, proprietary format of that. Same thing with AWS has uh, cloud formation as they call it. But there's also, you know, vendor neutral, third party, uh, vendor agnostic type approaches uh, called Terraform, for example, which is the most popular. And in that in that type of infrastructure as code, you can essentially pre-provision, you know, uh, what you want to have from a networking perspective, from an identity and access management perspective. You know, what kind of servers, what kind of storage, all those kind of things can be pre-provisioned and written into the scripts and then used on demand. Um, and as far as being approved, you know, it really depends on your environment. Anyone can essentially write these and use them. Uh, but if you've implemented some kind of governance, some kind of rigor, and some kind of process into your environment, that's where you can uh, have these pre-vetted, you know, infrastructure as code templates. And that's something I actually talk about in the article I mentioned on CSO Online as far as the CISA, Cloud Security Technical Reference Architecture document. I think it would really uh, benefit the federal government to have a, a federal-wide, you know, infrastructure as code repository of pre-hardened templates that system owners across the federal government can take and use uh, to quickly get you know spun up around you know maybe they need a three tier web app or whatever the common use case is have that in place harden align with your compliance requirements your configuration requirements and that would be very beneficial both from a time and speed perspective but also from a, a security perspective. So that's distinct from software library. It's not a software library you're talking about. Not necessarily. No, it's uh, you know it, it is like uh, it, it will become you know defined via software into the cloud environment, but it's not the same as a software library of pre-approved software necessarily. Um, the good thing is, is from a shift left security perspective, you can also use security tools. Um, you know, a couple of the most popular ones are companies like Acurix 
or Bridge Crew. A Curix was recently bought by Tenable, and Bridge Crew was bought by Palo Alto, which kind of signals you know how critical this is that those major companies are getting into the fold here. Um, and you can run scans on these infrastructure as code templates to identify you know misconfigurations or concerning co- configurations or compliance deviations. Uh, so you know we talk about shifting security left. You're catching those before you ever provision those in your environment. Uh, so before it ever becomes in a runtime environment and becomes something that you need to be concerned with and is out there and could be exploited by an adversary, you've already caught it before it's ever been put in place. Let's take a break. Come back, talk more about cloud and cloud and security for the federal government. You are listening to Federal Tech Talk with John Gilroy on Federal News Network. Today, we are speaking with Chris Hughes, co-founder of Acquia. Welcome back to Federal Tech Talk with John Gilroy here on Federal News Network. Our guest today is Chris Hughes, co-founder of a company called Acquia, A-Q-U-I-A dot U-S. And uh, before the break, we touched on this topic of shift left. But before I shift left, sounds like a football thing. Before I shift left, I want to talk about your podcast. So tell me about your podcast. This is uh, two podcasts in the studio at the same time. If I can't shut us up, huh? So tell us about your podcast. Yeah, definitely. Uh, you know, it was kind of a, a random idea. I'm, I'm a big listener of your show, so I'm honored to be here for one. But, you know, I love podcasts and listening to that kind of content, whether I'm on a drive or, or you know, working out, whatever the case is. Uh, so I had an idea to start a podcast. It's called Resilient Cyber is the name of the podcast. We had a first season wrap up uh, last year. We had about 24 episodes. And we had folks from commercial and uh, federal government leaders come in and talk about how to build more uh, resilient organizations through technology, essentially. Yeah, resiliency is just about everything. You know, it's a very hot topic, so I think it's well worth a listen. And I follow him again on LinkedIn, and, and that's really a good way to find his podcast, I think. H-U-G-H-E-S. I mean, that's pretty simple to find. <laughs> and you follow him, and you get updates on the podcast. Uh, before the break. Uh, you use this uh, phrase, shift left. Now, this is not a political discussion, so we have <laughs> to throw that aside. So when you're with a bunch of software developers, normally you talk about hot sauce, and you talk about cars, and then you probably talk about shift left. So what's shift left from a software development perspective? Yeah, essentially, you know, we all know from a cybersecurity perspective, there's been several studies on this topic that, you know, mitigating vulnerabilities once they're in a production environment is more uh, timely. It can have impacts to operations, for example. It can have a lot more uh, financial ramifications if it interrupts you know, business, and it takes more money and more resources to address once it's in a production environment. So the concept of shifting left is uh, bringing security into the fold from a software development lifecycle perspective and addressing vulnerabilities earlier in the lifecycle uh, so it can avoid those disruptions to the business, operations, the, the financial impact is, is far less, and essentially it's just bringing security into that lifecycle much earlier in the process. So instead of hiring a kid out of college to do the testing, the testing and security is, is baked into the process right from the get-go. You know, that's the transition that DOD tried to make, at least verbally, a few years back was that it, it's, it's integral to it, huh? Yeah, definitely. That's the goal of, of shifting left. And you know, we see it as part of what we're seeing now with the whole DevSecOps push that we see within the federal government is you know, kind of breaking down, down those silos between the development, uh, security, and operations teams and getting them to work together as a cohesive unit uh, and, and using things such as cloud and infrastructure as code and some of the things we talked about is where you can really bring that to a reality in terms of shifting left and, and finding vulnerabilities earlier in the life cycle, whether from an infrastructure perspective or an application uh, code perspective, for example. And that's what, kind of what we're shooting for. You know, Chris, I spent years working with software developers. And you, you can't talk to these, these, these people without a, a whiteboard. And they always have a timeline. And, and that's what you're talking about. Instead of this point in time, I'm going to shift left to this point in the timeline to worry about the security because that's what the shift is all about, shift left. And there's, there's other technologies out there like right shift. and the, anyway, Left shift means earlier in the whole software process itself. Um, uh, we talked about SaaS earlier, and I guess enterprise architecture involves governance of SaaS. And so – Seems to be high priority in your list. Why should it be a, a priority for my govies? Yeah, and going back to that article, I guess uh, you know that CISA reference architecture. It talks a lot about cloud security posture management. Uh, but when it talks about cloud security posture management, it's always from the lens of infrastructure as a, a service. For example, if you're using a big cloud provider like uh, AWS, Azure, or Google Cloud, you know most agencies, for example, are using you know one or three of the major three cloud providers, basically. Um, but on that note, they're using tens to hundreds of SaaS providers instead of just a few IS providers. Uh, so we're, we put a lot of focus on securing infrastructure as a service in environments like AWS and Azure and such, uh, but there's not much of a focus on securing and implementing governance from a SaaS perspective. 
um, actually did a, an article on this as well recently. Uh, part of the issue is most agencies, they really don't even know what's being used from a SaaS perspective. Uh, a lot of times the security team isn't even the unit that's uh, you know, provisioning these SaaS services. Anyone can use a credit card and quickly get up and running, for example, and start consuming these services. So you have no visibility of what's being used across the agency or the, uh, the organization. You have no idea who has access to it. You know, if they've left the organization, if they still have access, you have no idea what kind of sensitive data has been put into those environments. And so it's really the Wild West, and it doesn't get talked, enough, uh, talked about enough from a cloud security perspective. Uh, during the break, uh, we talked about several companies in this space. One was Tenable, and there's a guy named Glenn Pendley. I don't know if you know him from Tenable, but he recently gave an uh, interview on a podcast, and he used the exact same phrase, posture management. He said, if you want to move to zero trust, then you should really position yourself to make that move. You have to posture yourself, posture management for that transition. And so I think this idea of, of, of setting the stage is important for theater. It's important for martial arts. It's important for repairing a car. It's also important for the transition to the cloud. So this posture management seems to be a, a very important part of this successful transition. That's correct. Yeah, it's getting that, you know, getting that environment, having that cybersecurity hygiene in place. If you're going to consume these as a service type models, is, is as you said, posture management is just kind of always constantly evaluating these environments and seeing if you're maintaining uh, compliance, if you're maintaining secu- security rigor and keeping things in line with your security requirements. And that's kind of the goal of cloud security posture management, SaaS security posture management, or any kind of posture management, essentially, and how you use that term. Speaking of terms, I just uh, used a term that's the phrase that pays, and the phrase is zero trust. <laughs> so, so you know, we're, we're sitting on your deck, and we're having iced tea. We're talking about football or something or other, and the topic of zero trust comes up and posture management. What about this whole idea of uh, enterprise architecture and architecture itself? Does, can that improve or impede the transition to zero trust? It definitely can, and I think uh, what we're seeing is the federal government has put out some great uh, guidance recently as part of the executive order. They had the, the federal trust – uh, uh, strategy for the federal government, and then they also had the federal tru- uh, or zero trust. I'm sorry, uh, maturity model. And I think that's kind of the recognition from the federal government that they understand that this is going to be a journey. It's going to be a process. It's not, you know, it, it's not. You don't buy one product and boom, we're we're zero trust now. It's part of a journey to get to that posture essentially, and that's what they're pushing for with these documents and this guidance uh, for federal agencies to use. When we talked about shift left, I, I use the phrase software developer and and. Uh, I guess I should be using a, a DevSec or DevSecOps or something like that. And so from a DevSecOps perspective, um, is, is this a real challenge for them or is this just a, a, another tweak and modification? Is this a major leap or just an just a, a adjustment for them? I definitely think for the, you know, for the very uh, uh, technological proficient folks that are used to working in DevOps or Dev, Dev, DevSecOps type environments, uh, moving towards a zero trust model is going to be easier. Uh, but that goes back to the workforce challenge, as I mentioned. So it depends on the, the maturity and the proficiency of the folks you have working in your environment uh, from a, a DevSecOps perspective. Um, you know, one thing we also talked about is uh, shifting security left, and part of doing that is empowering developers. Uh, we, we understand there's not enough security people essentially to cover everything, every team, every environment within your organization. So establishing a security culture, empowering developers and DevSecOps engineers, things of that sort, is really how you can shift left and, and help push towards zero trust. I'd like to give you your uh, opinion on this one. I've talked to so many people about DevSecOps and, and agile software development. And uh, one person told me that uh, the good news and bad news about uh, Agile is that the good news is, is is that they work with teams together and they can uh, filter through problems quickly, a lot of communication. But the weakness is, is they're not open to newer technology because they're looking backwards so so much and trying to integrate and, and have communications that they're not open-minded enough to look at new technologies. How's that for a, a line? What do you, so can you defend or attack that one? I actually would attack that. I don't know that I agree with that. I think folks who are, are kind of espousing and pursuing agile practices and DevSecOps are, you know, part of that, that fundamental concept is being open to a learning and experimentation. Uh, so that kind of is contradictory to it if they're not open to new, new technologies. So I think if you're using agile practices and you're moving towards DevSecOps, uh, you're going to be open to experimentation, embracing new technologies that can make things better for the organization. And ultimately, the goal is to deliver value, whether to the federal uh, you know, stakeholder or the DOD warfighter or, or system owner, for example. I honestly think it's got something with age. And people ask me how old I am. I say I'm uh, closer to 50 than I am to 40. <laughs> My guess is, Chris, you're closer to 40 <laughs> than to 50. I think it's an age thing, too. I think, you know, let, let's, you know, people tend to get stuck in their ways. And I think younger people, especially from diverse backgrounds, uh, if you come from uh, 
non-traditional background and you're dumped into this, you can have more creative and flexible ways to approach it. And I think that's that's one of the strengths and weaknesses of, of agile software development is that um, uh, sometimes they're not going to be warm and inviting for people who have you know, people, for example, in a science background coming into that. I mean, not people who have math background coming in. Maybe they they are the ones, the younger ones from math and science background, will be more flexible to to new ideas rather than uh, their the old geezers like me. I don't know. That's, that's a statement I'm making, and I'm kind of putting myself in a bad position. But I, I that's my experience. It's uh, if I if I could on that note real quick, you know, I think that you know we talked about the workforce a bit, and the reality is I don't know the number off the top of my head, but an overwhelming majority of the federal workforce is near retirement age, um, and and that's a reality that we have to deal with. Uh, so I think it's, you know, while it's true that there may be some uh, pre-existing, you know, behavioral patterns among the older part of the workforce, we have to acknowledge that, you know, older folks are a big part of the workforce and they're key to help us transition where we need to go. Hey, let's take a break here. Come back, talk more about the workforce. You are listening to Federal Tech Talk with John Gilroy here on Federal News Network. Our guest today is Chris Hughes, co-founder of Acquia. Welcome back to Federal Tech Talk with John Gilroy here on Federal News Network. Our guest today is Chris Hughes. He's co-founder of a company called Acquia, A-Q-U-I-A dot U-S. And we've been talking about the transition from the cloud and federal cybersecurity issues. We've touched on so many different topics today. Um, One little phrase, acronym that came up in the previous discussion was ATO. Perhaps you can define that for some of the people who don't know about it and uh, talk about ATOs working with uh, software developers, DevSecOps people. Yeah, definitely. For those not familiar with the term, the the concept means authority to operate. Uh, So in the context of the federal government, they have to align with what's called the risk management framework. Uh, So any system going into a production environment essentially receives an authority to operate uh, from an authorizing official, which is essentially them blessing the system, saying they acknowledge the risk that the system presents and they accept that risk on behalf of the organization. Um, as far as a, dev, a DevSecOps context goes, uh, we're seeing a push towards uh, software factories within the federal government, especially in DOD. You talk, talk about programs like um, Platform One, uh, Kessel Run, uh, within the ECMA agency, within the Army, and Paul Puckett and those folks uh, moving towards a software factory type model. And what those folks are doing is they're essentially maximizing the, the concept of control inheritance uh, from cloud security – I'm sorry, cloud service providers and letting uh, DOD mission owners or federal, federal system owners – essentially inherit controls from the cloud service provider. Uh, They're building platforms on top of those cloud service environments and letting uh, people inherit controls from those platforms. And then essentially mission owners or system owners only need to focus on their application and the code for the application and and vulnerabilities associated with that. So it it streamlines that ATO process, and that's what they're pursuing with the the software factory concept. So Kessel Run, I think, is up in Boston. It's one of these software factories. So where does that fit in with the, uh, the IC discussion earlier? Does it fit in completely with it? Uh, definitely, IAC is a, a key component of that. So, as I mentioned, they're you know they're maximizing security control inheritance uh, through you know leveraging cloud service environments from cloud service providers. And a lot of times, you can use, as I mentioned, native uh, you know tooling such as CloudFormation from Amazon, for example, or Azure Blueprints from Microsoft Azure, or you can use vendor agnostic approach like Terraform, all of which are infrastructure as code uh, formats. And you can stand up uh, infrastructure for these software factories and allow uh, mission owners and system owners to build on top of that and focus on their applications. I, um, I'm in the classroom frequently. You're in the classroom frequently. And uh, I always think about my students. And so if, if one of my students or your students says, well, where can I learn more? So where would you direct them? Of course, to your podcast. Tell us about your podcast and, and what are good areas to learn more about this whole topic of DevSecOps, transition to cloud and cybersecurity? Yeah, definitely. So, you know, I know we talked about the workforce. Uh, I'm a big proponent of independent learning, and there's a lot of uh, available learning methods out there that are cheap and affordable and on demand, whether it's on your mobile device or your your laptop. Uh, There's websites such as A-Cloud Guru, which got purchased by Pluralsight, so you can use Pluralsight. Uh, There's Udemy, U-D-E-M-Y. All these sites have a lot of great uh, training options to learn about DevSecOps, infrastructure as code. Uh, And then there's also training from the cloud service providers themselves. If you go to AWS or Azure's websites, you can read uh, quite a bit about their infrastructure as code opportunities, uh, how you can use them, and you see examples. And then you can quickly get into those environments and use a trial account and play around with it and see how it works. Any good YouTube videos you follow or podcasts you follow? Uh, definitely. There's a, a lot of pod t- a podcasts I follow on this area, you know, one of which is called the Cloud Security Podcast, uh, hosted by an individual from Australia, Australia actually, named Ashish. And he has a really popular podcast uh, discussing cloud security, but they dive into a lot of these DevSecOps and DevOps types topics and have uh, pr- you know folks from the companies that we've discussed on, on the show. Wow. Guy from Australia. That's interesting. Um, a lot has been going on in the federal government in the last year. And believe it or not, there has been a gap 
in news about one topic, and the gap in the last seven, eight months has been with updates and news on CMMC. I mean, I can remember going to LinkedIn and getting hit over the head with CMMC. It was Chris about CMMC and John about CMMC and Peter about CMMC and Sally and then Janet and Marianne. Everyone was talking CMMC. Uh, Arrington was everywhere. I think she was at the street corner at 18th and K and uh, billboards and skywriting. And all of a sudden, Jan, sh- silence. <laughs> so what the heck is going on with CMMC and, and what's this got to do with the cloud and cloud transition? Yeah, definitely. CMMC is a hot topic, you know, uh, is set to impact over 300,000 uh, uh, companies as, as part of the defense industrial base. Uh, we're seeing other organizations outside of DOD start to look at it, such as G- uh, G- uh, GSA and DHS that may include it in some of their acquisition activities. And it stands for Cybersecurity Maturity Model Certification. And the intent is it's part of an, uh, an initiative essentially to, to secure the supply chain for the federal government. Uh, so it's bringing you know, requirements from things such as NIST 800-171 and others uh, to the defense industrial base. Um, you know, we know that we need to secure in, uh, organizations that are doing business with the federal government. And that's where CMMC came about, uh, building on top of NIST 800-171. Uh, but the challenge there is, you know, we've seen a shrinking defense industrial base as well, and this is not a cheap endeavor. It's going to be something that requires a lot of time and attention from organizations. Uh, so it's kind of a dichotomy where you want to secure the supply chain, uh, but you also want to make it to where you don't squeeze folks out of that supply chain to where they lose small, innovative firms doing work with the federal government. And my uh, wife and I were in Texas on Sunday. There's restaurants where I think we can go in, and if you can eat the whole steak, you don't have to pay for it. It's a two-pound steak. Or I don't know, some crazy thing like that. And uh, when I first heard the number 300,000, I said to myself, wow, that's, that, that's a big number. It, it's just that, and it's, it's three or four years off, maybe 24, 25. But looking at it, 300,000, I mean, that, <laughs> maybe that number has to shrink. Maybe there has to be some alterations or changes in, in maybe the, the, the types of uh, certification and compliance there. But um, it, it's almost like uh, they, uh, to use a steak analogy, here's bit off more than they can chew. And maybe they, they, maybe it's too big. I mean, uh, I think it's possible that the DOD will come up with some modifications and altering on the CMMC in the next few months because there's a lot of clamor in the industry yelling and screaming and pounding on tables, isn't there? Yeah, definitely. There's a lot of interest in this from the industry. You know, we've seen – uh, uh, many many folks pop up, you know, trying to help and, and prepare organizations get get prepared for CMMC and take advantage of the business opportunity from a con- consultation perspective. Uh, but the reality is, like you know, working with the federal government does require a level of security rigor. And if your organization's not able to uh, you know respond to that, maybe it, it may not be the right environment for you. But that said, there's a lot of innovative things that can be done, whether it's from the prime contractor perspective or the federal government perspective. Uh, maybe uh, set up set up such as a, a cloud enclave, right, for defense industrial based uh, companies to come work in. That's you know hardened and secured, and they can keep you know CUI uh, that control and classified information, for example, in that environment and mitigate some of the risk where appropriate. Uh, and I talked about infrastructure as code and, and you know security control inheritance and things like that. And some of these loud cloud, loud uh, or large cloud service providers, I'm sorry, uh, can provide these environments to help you get up to speed and meet a lot of the requirements that would be uh, very expensive for you to meet as a small business, for example. Uh, so that's where cloud and infrastructure as code comes into play is leveraging those environments. Uh, going in there, inheriting some of those controls, and, and they've even talked about reciprocity with things like FedRAMP uh, for some of the cloud service providers. Uh, so there's definitely a lot of potential there and innovative solutions, and it remains to be seen how that's going to play out. Well, this is a podcast. It's also a radio show, and uh, one of the radio personalities in here is Jason Miller. And you and I can look through the window here. We can see Jason Miller doing a show right across from us, can't we? <laughs> yep. He uh, wrote an article a couple weeks back about uh, changes coming to CMMC and DOD cybersecurity and the lead was, you know, industry organizations, IT Industry Council, Professional Services Council, NDIA, the folks in Arlington there, they're, they're, they're fed up. They're sick of it. You know, I mean, there's millions of dollars involved in this compliance and there's uh, no guidance. Uh, and if you, if you look at the problem, if you just look at it from a, an organizational perspective, some of the key decision makers at the DOD, some undersecretaries, the, the positions are blank. They're empty. And so, so how can John Gilroy's software company – question what the guidelines are where we, we're kind of in a, um, a transition here. And, and I think it get, it's getting people kind of more and more curious and they, they want something to happen. 
Yeah, no doubt about it. We know that the, there's kind of been a lull, as you've mentioned, you know, from the perspective of personalities like Kitty Arrington, but also from the policy perspective. And we know that changes are coming. We don't know what those are. And we've seen groups like you mentioned, like NDIA, start to uh, show some of that angst and fr- frustration from the industry. Uh, they're preparing to you know, align with and respond to these, uh, these policy and certification requirements, but they're lacking guidance. And that's causing a lot of frustration among the defense industrial base at the moment. And I think to their credit, when they offered some of these initial guidelines, there were like four or 500 comments initially. Then they had uh, some more changes, and there was like 800 comments. And so I think, to be fair, I think they're thoroughly going through the comments and saying, well, geez, maybe I can, maybe I can be agile <laughs> and, and respond to this. But, but the problem is, I mean, there are big companies, and, and this is probably going to affect smaller companies more than anyone else on and how much money do they – and if they, they commit to a, a, a consulting group for $500,000 – and then what happens if it changes after they spend the money? I mean this is this is a pretty serious question. Yeah, definitely. It's leaving a lot of people in limbo. And as you mentioned, it's, uh, it's largely impacting small and mid-sized businesses who don't have the internal expertise from an IT or cybersecurity perspective. So they're working with outside uh, consultants and such to prepare for this. And as you mentioned, that, that law and lack of the guidance is causing a lot of frustration. And also there's a lot of danger in that because organizations are taking advantage of the opportunity you know, to work with small businesses and advise them. And they may be giving them wrong information or, or not you know, really giving them the, the right steps to take. And it's causing a lot of frustration. Let's take a break. When we come back, we'll talk more about the workforce and this whole change to a cybersecurity environment in the cloud. You are listening to Federal Tech Talk with John Gilroy here on Federal News Network. Our guest today, Chris Hughes, co-founder of Acquia. Welcome to Federal Tech Talk with John Gilroy here on Federal News Network. Our guest today is Chris Hughes, co-founder of Acquia, A-Q-U-I-A dot U-S. For more information, Chris has a podcast about cybersecurity. Hit us up on that. What's it called again? Resilient Cyber Podcast. Great. Resilient Cyber Podcast. Kind of a good thing to listen to, all kinds of interesting information, maybe a little bit of federal focus, but a general focus. But if it's federal, if it's civilian, the problem people are having today is with workforce, you know. If I go to my local Chick-fil-A, the guy's going to close down the dining hall because he can't get people. (laughs) <laughs> My local Harris Teeter is going to start closing at 9 because they can't get people. <laughs> and these are silly COVID-related issues. I know that. But in the federal government, there are also issues with, with uh, attracting talent and retaining that talent. And so, so where do you fit in this discussion and where does this whole idea of, of – uh, cloud and cloud security fit in the discussion of retaining talent for the government. Yeah, this is a topic I'm super passionate about, you know, having been an a active duty military member and then also a civil service employee with two different organizations. Uh, as we talked about earlier, the overwhelming majority of the federal workforce is at, near, you know, at or near retirement age, and they've struggled to attract and retain younger tech talent with, competing with, you know, tech companies in Silicon Valley and things of that nature, uh, despite their modernization and technology goals, which is a real problem. Uh, so this is something I find myself talking about quite a bit, and we've seen some promising uh, activity around things like the Cyber Reskilling Academy and things that are underway uh, within the federal government. But you know, the, some of the problems that I've seen is the hiring timelines. You know, you can take six to eighteen months to get hired, and I've experienced this personally. You know, well over a year to get hired at a federal agency from the time you begin a discussion to the time you actually start working there. Uh, most individuals, you know, if they have another, uh, and young individuals in particular, if they have another employment opportunity that's going to pay them much sooner, they're gone. Uh, you've lost that individual. Uh, so that's part of the struggle there is the hiring timeline itself. Uh, and then also, you know, they also tend to lump all IT professionals in just a few categories, like as uh, IT specialists, you know, 2210, for example, things like that, uh, labor categories. Uh, and then there's also pay disparities, obviously, between the federal environment and the private sector. And that's a longstanding problem. Uh, something I think the federal government can do, though, is really focus on the mission focus. And that's what's kept me in the federal space is, you know, no private organization I go to is really going to come close to some of the mission opportunities and the impact that you can have at some of these federal environments. You know, I, I think uh, there are um, many federal agencies that are, are locked into this is where we've always done it. And DevSecOps is we don't care. <laughs> we don't care. I've always done it. This is going to be we're going to try this, we're going to try this and try that. And so from a, a federal environment, how do you up, you know, update the, the, the skill requirements and, and how do you shift things to the cloud and DevSecOps? I mean, it seems like a, a hard sell. It definitely is. You know, it's, it's something you need to win people over on. And, and I think that that 
kind of mantra, this is the way we've always done it, is incredibly toxic and, and damaging. You know, We're seeing uh, near-peer adversaries continue to catch up to us around technology and things like that, national security capabilities. Uh, so the idea of this is the way we've already done it doesn't fly anymore. Uh, you know, Commercial organizations are innovating well, fast, well faster than the federal government is and doing things in a lot more agile, iterative way. Uh, so we need to try to follow those practices in, in, in order to maintain our national security uh, advantages. And so the the idea that you know this is the way we've always done it, that's not going to fly anymore. We need to do away with that mindset, be open to new ideas, uh, uh, experimentation, bringing diverse perspectives and backgrounds into the fold, and really uh, you know bring an innovative culture to the federal government. Well, you're a relatively young man. You're going to be around for a few decades. And I always uh, like to see what you are predicting and forecasting for the next five, ten years here. Um, I, I'm on record as saying I think there's going to be an incident where something is going to happen and it's going to hit someone, as they say, upside the head and they're going to dr- and change. I mean, that's, that's a typical human pattern. I mean, you know, you walk down the street and you don't get the umbrella until it starts to rain or something. And then you run into the 7-Eleven over and buy an umbrella. So what do you predict is going to happen in the next uh, five to ten years with uh, cloud transition and the federal government? You know, we've heard that, that- – you know, uh, there's concepts of people talking about like a cyber 9-11, for example. Uh, and that's a scenario that we don't want to see unfold. Uh, but we've done a lot of talking about cyber being a priority, you know, cloud uh, cloud adoption and cloud security being a priority. Uh, but really, it's a lot of talk, a lot of talk. And that's some, you know, something we've heard federal leaders echo is that it's, it's a lot of talk. And unfortunately, I think we will see an incident that really wakes people up, whether it's, a, you know, something on the supply chain, uh, something from a critical infrastructure perspective that makes us wake up and take this much more seriously across the federal government and our society as a whole. The cybersecurity professional in the future, do you think they're going to be armed with um, logic and uh, interpersonal skills? Or are they going to be armed with coding skills? Or are they going to be armed with mathematical skills? Um, so what's the skill set that's going to win here in the next five years? Yeah, I think uh, that, that's a really good question. It's something that you, know, you and I talked about off air a bit is that, you know, uh, definitely coding skills are going to become more prevalent as we see infrastructure as code, compliance as code, you know, cloud native environments and the shift that we see with software factories, for example, and shift for DevSecOps. Uh, but that said, there's no discounting the soft skills, the business acumen, uh, understanding what, what our organizations do, what is their mission, what, is the, you know, what are they trying to achieve, being able to communicate, being able to storytell, go out and, and sell what you're trying to achieve from a cybersecurity perspective is something that's going to be very important. So I would really try to focus on not only you know being strong technically, but having strong social Social skills, uh, storytelling, re- relationship building, crisis communication, all those things are going to be relevant for the future cybersecurity professional. When you are in your classroom and students ask you if uh, uh, what's it like working for the federal government and they're considering applying for jobs in the federal government, what do you tell them? I, I tend to be honest with them. You know, I tend to talk about a lot of what we've talked about is like, you know, there's definitely a difference between what you may see on like a, an Air Force recruiting commercial, for example, uh, versus what you may experience in the real world from a technological perspective when you start working with the DOD and the federal government. Uh, that said, I don't downplay the reality of what the mission is and the impact that you can have within these organizations. Uh, there's a lot of promise to, to you know, there's, there's currents on their way in terms of inter- innovation, modernization, cloud adoption, DevSecOps. Uh, so these these ideas really get people excited about working for their federal government and where things are trending. Uh, so I really try to sell on those points because we need all the, the innovative, you know, diverse viewpoints and technical proficient people we can get. So for a student of yours, do they think of directly applying for a job at DHS or do they think of working for a company like uh, GDIT or do they think of getting a job at uh, Accenture or something like that. What is their perspective of uh, helping out the federal government with their cyber challenge? I think I've seen mixed. Like I've seen people who want to work directly for a federal agency and then others who, you know, want to go towards, you know, uh, a defense industrial based company or a vendor supporting the federal government, for example, like you named GDIT and Accenture and others. Uh, and, and the, you know, some people are interested in that, uh, but more so they're just interested in working in the federal environment overall. Uh, and then we talked about the workforce and some of the challenges. You know, part of that challenge is if you apply in USA Jobs, you know, you're just blindly throwing your name in a bucket, and and maybe you hear back in a year <laughs> if a candidate was selected and it wasn't you or, or it is you, whatever the case is. And that and so those things can be real uh, discouraging for folks applying in these environments. So a lot of times they do tend to go towards uh, you know those organizations that are supporting the government from the industry side of things. Do you think prospective, let's say students who want to work for the federal government, should they actually reach out and try to make a connection within the federal government or or are there job fairs? Because I, I think this impersonal nature of just dumping at a job site, I think that's weak. But I think maybe there's if there's somewhere they can connect to someone, uh, how, how would they do it? 
And there's definitely a lot of ways to do that, and I'm not I'm not an expert on that front, you know. But I have worked for organizations such as the Navy, where I worked for uh, Spay, War, Spay War Atlantic, now called NIWIC or Nav War, uh, and we would hold job fairs and have you know events where we would be on the military base at supporting an air show or something like that, and talking to STEM students and telling them about what we do, you know, what we what we contribute to the Navy and why it's important, and that would get people's attention. So I think job fairs and uh, things like that are very important. And also, I can't emphasize enough, you know, you've talked a lot about uh, following me on LinkedIn, but getting active in a social media network where you have have uh, some of these hiring authorities, some of these uh, individuals that are building these programs and trying to push for innovation and making those relationships, showing what you're passionate about, showing what you're proficient in, and that can go a long way. And I think that is the breakthrough. Uh, There's a gentleman at the station called Mark Amtower, and he talks about the hundreds of thousands of govies who are on LinkedIn. And I think if you are an undergraduate now and you would like to work for the federal government, maybe work for uh, the intelligence community or work for NIH, whatever you have a passion for, I think trying to get on LinkedIn and try and develop relationships with people over a long period of time, uh, making comments and going back and forth, I think just, just the physical face there breaks through a whole lot of barriers. And I think that's, that's, um, that's a good counter-argument to just submitting your resume and, and, and hoping and waiting. I mean, it's, it's a, a spray and pray technique, which really doesn't work. But uh, I like the idea of developing long-term relationships with people in the federal government because believe it or not, they are on LinkedIn, aren't they? Yeah, they definitely are. I mean, that's kind of how I started on LinkedIn is just talking about things I'm passionate about when it comes to the federal government and cybersecurity and cloud adoption and uh, DevSecOps and things of that nature. And I've started to connect with many, many government individuals, whether they're actually a government employee, former government a government employee, working on the industry side of things now. And, and that said, I also encourage the federal government employees listening to this kind of thing to get involved in LinkedIn. Uh, there's a lot of people that are not necessarily at leadership levels who are voicing frustrations or uh, innovative ideas and things like that through LinkedIn and other you know, uh, business networks like that where you can go on and get plugged in and hear from perspectives that you may not hear uh, through your kind of rigid chain of command, for example. Oh, that's a great idea. Unfortunately, Chris, we're running out of time here. You are listening to Federal Tech Talk with John Gilroy here on Federal News Network. I'd like to thank our guest, Chris Hughes, co-founder of Acquia, A-Q-U-I-A dot U-S. You've been listening to Federal Tech Talk with John Gilroy, managing partner at the Oakmont Group on Federal News Network. Tune in Tuesday afternoons at 1 or subscribe to this show on iTunes or Podcast One. T-Mobile for Business, unconventional thinking means we see things differently so you can focus on what matters most. That's why we've become the leader in 5G, number one in customer satisfaction, and a partner who includes 5G in every plan so you get it all. Unconventional thinking is better for business. Open Signal awards T-Mobile as America's fastest 5G network USA. 5G user experience report July 2021. Capable device acquired. Coverage not available in some areas. Some users may require certain plan or features. See T-Mobile.com. For J.D. Power 2020 award information, visit jdpower.com slash awards.